without further ado, we're going to jump into the class. Tonight's class is titled Troubles of Education. So those of you who know me, you know I have a special uh, place in my heart for the classroom team. Uh, my background goes into being a teacher. So now that we have the wisdom of the scriptures, whether you have children, whether you don't have children and you're just serving, um, serving your people in the body or in the classroom around the world, <laughs> you, uh, hopefully this class is going to be edifying so that we can increase and deal with our children uh, as the true heritage of the Lord. So let's jump into it. Let's get Romans 15 and 4. Romans 15, verse 4. The troubles of education. This is the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 4. Go ahead. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Go ahead. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we always start here because the scriptures are what really instruct us to wisdom. The scriptures are what give us, if you, for uh, lack of better words, the scriptures are our learning curriculum. As we grow and develop in this walk to be better servants, to be better husbands, fathers, uh, women, uh, wives, right? As we strive to be better, the scriptures are our instruction, right? So that through them we may have comfort and build hope. Go to Romans 12, verse 2, because this is what it, Helps us to do. Go ahead. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh -huh. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're going to unfold that a little bit. And be not conformed to this world. This world has its own way that it wants us to follow. Much of this world is a seduction, and that seduction is to much wickedness. So the scriptures teach us to not be conformed to this world and be transformed. So we got to have some type of change that goes on with us when we go to the scriptures. That's why it's a part of spa class. Study, we pray, and we apply. And as a result of applying and application, there's a transformation and a change that happens within us and in our spirit. Then it says that we may prove. So the actions are going to be evaluated. So that's kind of like in school. Your actions are evaluated. They call them tests, standardized tests, right? That you may prove that what you're doing is good and acceptable according to the will of God. So at the end of the day, whether we are children in this truth, babes in the, we can call it babes, children, right? Eventually, we're going to have to meet our maker, and he's going to give us a grade. A there's a benchmark that has to be met by the Most High God. And all praise to the Most High. Our, our teacher is Christ. So he's going to advocate for us and teach us certain things and instruct us, give, a, you know, give us certain instructions, sometimes a little bit of discipline. Right? We need those things in this truth that we may be examples of what this Bible actually says. So how does that convert to children? How does that convert to children? Let's get Psalm 127. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 127, verse 1. Let's get that. This is the book of Psalm, chapter 127 and verse 1. Uh-huh. Except the Lord build the house. Stop. Read it again. Except the Lord build the house. If Christ is not the foundation of how you're building your household, building up yourself, read. They labor in vain that build it. So, it, it, this walk will be in vain if you're not setting Christ as your foundation. Understand that. Anything that we do with this understanding has to be set upon the foundation of Christ or else we're going to see it fail. It's not going to prosper because it's not rooted in God's law, statutes, and commandments and not rooted in the faith of Jesus Christ. Read on. Except the Lord keep the city. Go ahead. The watchman waketh but in vain. Now jump to verse 3. Verse 3. 
lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. So children are in heritage of the Lord. That's how the Lord keeps our nation going. If you, if you read the scriptures, you see that throughout generations, whether it was the Egyptian captivity, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Mede, Greek, Roman, they've all been set to try to annihilate us as a people. All the other nations have wanted to see our hurt. They wanted to see our destruction. So when we bring forth children, we have to be very mindful of what it is that we're teaching. We got to be mindful of how we deal with them and how we build their values that as they grow, that they'll be standing in the same lot that we're standing in right now and even stronger than we are, right? So children are here to the Lord of the Lord, read. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I want to put this out there. I don't have biological children yet. However, in the scriptures, and that may be the case of some people in the body, right? There are, let's get uh, Sirach, Sirach 4. So people say, well, why you care so much? You can't tell me nothing about being no parent. Well, if we're all one family, don't, uh, we, we always heard growing up that it takes a village to raise children. We all play a part in the development of the children of our nation. We all play a part. But we only learn that separate household and no, no uh, <laughs> we only learned that in these last days. But for a long time, our people always joined together. If it wasn't so, when Christ got lost from his mother and his father, they said, oh, he's in the company of our kindred. So everybody was responsible for the children. Everybody. So we all need to be looking at the children that run around our congregation, whether it's at our local congregation or abroad when we do bigger events. We need to be looking at them at as our children. We should care for them as a part of our nation. And we got to renew our mind to have that for their betterment. Go ahead, read that. Uh, Sarat 4, dealing with father to the fatherless. I think it's verse 10. Let me get there with you. Sarat chapter 4, verse 10. Yes. It's the book of Sarat, chapter 4 and verse 10. Go ahead. Be as a father unto the fatherless. Go ahead. And instead of an husband, unto their mother. Go ahead. So shalt thou be as the son of the Most High, uh -huh. and he shall love thee more than thy mother do doth. So what is that going into? We have a, and, and this goes into administering the medicine that our nation needs. We have a lot of single parent households within our nation. Who's going to step up and be that father figure to those young men? Who's going to be that example of what a father or a man is in the house of, of Israel to these young women. Who, who's going to be those cornerstones? Who's going to be those builders for those young spirits that need that figure in their life? This is a commandment that shows us be as a father to the fatherless. And it, it don't encompass trying to slide up on the, uh, the sister who the mother is. You know what I'm saying? It, it don't encompass all that. But we can all play that father figure. We can all be that big sister, that, that mother figure to these children because you may see that need. These children need to see proper examples. And by your proper example, they're going to learn a multitude of positive values. And we got to understand that. Go back to Psalm 127. So that's a part of us understanding heritage. A heritage. A heritage is something that continues on and values are passed down through those generations. So what values are we establishing based on the, uh, the laws of God? And what are we passing on by our example to the children who are watching us day in and day out? Or do we just leave them off by the wayside? Because watch this. Esau is watching them too. If we're not watching our children, the other nations are watching them, and they will use them for their bidding. So, read that again, verse 3. Psalm, chapter 127, and uh -huh. verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. Go ahead. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. So, if you have one child, two child, three child, four child, ten children, that is your reward given to you by the Lord. And you're going to be held responsible for building up that child's life, right? But then also, as a nation, we should all 
rejoice in seeing a child succeed, right? Read verse 4. Verse 4. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, Go ahead. so are children of the youth. So they're a part of our nation's strength. The way that we deal with our children is a part of us strengthening the nation. Because uh, what's the, the uh, bishop called him James Esau. He says that it's just a matter of time before our organization becomes fractured. Now, what does that technically mean? It means that in layman's terms, you Negroes ain't going to raise your children right. They ain't going to know what to believe in. And in a matter of time, I'll make them homosexuals and I'll have them doing my bidding. I, I'll create them and make them into a useless generation because you ain't going to do nothing with them. But that's if we despise God's laws. If we actually take heed to them, they're going to be our strength in these last days as we are waiting the return of our Messiah. Read verse 5. Verse 5, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Go ahead. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, that first part, it said, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You know, Israel can't stop having babies. Since the time of the Egyptians, shoot, the more they afflicted us, the more we grew. You see babies coming... <laughs> Uh, shoot, a soldier just had a baby. Shoot, I think two uh, two, uh, two brothers uh, shot the club up same time. You know, the baby's coming out. Hey, Israel is going to have children. That's what we do. That's right. That's what we do, right? Make sure you're having your children in righteousness. Marry before you carry. All right, let's make, put that out there. All right? So it says they shall not be ashamed. Why? We won't be ashamed or confounded because we understand our faith. We understand the tenets of, of God's laws. We understand the value and the wisdom that comes with applying God's law. That way, our children should never be ashamed. But when they are ashamed, whether they're going out uh, to school, it's because something ain't steady yet. So that means that as their guardians, as their parents, we got to always be in that evaluation mode of, how to teach the concepts of the scriptures to them and then also guide them, guide them so that they don't feel ashamed about calling them, knowing that they're, the, that they're an Israelite, right? So it says, they shall not be ashamed. Read on. But they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. They shall speak with the enemies. So what is that going to go into? We should be putting our children and ex exposing them to so much critical thinking, exposing them to information, things that to where they're ambassadors for our people. No longer should we be just uh, uh, putting our children into the hands of other nations so that they can use them. We need to be creating ambassadors for our nation so that there's security for our people. Now, uh, get Sirach 16 and verse 1. Sirach chapter 16, verse 1. So that's the importance of our children. Understanding that these, uh, these our children, need to be uh, fashioned for the Lord's use. There's a purpose for them being created, and we need to be making sure that we foster that purpose and, and prime them up to be used by the Lord, right? Go ahead. Sirach, chapter 16 and verse 1. Go ahead. Desire not a multitude of unprofitable children. So desire not a multitude of unprofitable children. How do children become unprofitable? Well, it starts with neglecting God's laws. But then what does it turn into? Well, it turns into the lamb falling to whoredom. It turns into children oppressing their own parents. We got plenty of clips and news, clip, uh, news articles about children turning on their parents. Children shooting up schools, children getting high drug overdosing, children killing other children because they don't have a sense of identity. That's what unprofitable children has turned into. Go ahead, read on. Neither delight in ungodly sons. Go ahead. Though they multiply, rejoice not in them. Go ahead. Except the fear of the Lord be with them. So the Bible says, don't rejoice in your sons or your daughters except the fear of the Lord be with them. You have some parents who will, in the midst of the congregation, 
tell their own child to lie. Don't, don't tell the truth. You shut up. Don't say nothing. I got this. Meanwhile, the child already admit, admitted they were guilty, but the parent is going to teach the child an evil lesson and say, no, don't say anything. Don't be truthful. Lie. So how is the child going to learn to fear the Lord if the parent is instructing them to not have fear of the Lord and break one of the big ten, as they say. That's evil as hell. You're wicked. You need to repent. And you will have blood on your hands if you don't fix that in your house. Understand that. Read it again. Though they multiply. Go ahead. Rejoice not in them. Go ahead. Except the fear of the Lord be with them. So you better be careful how you're raising your children. Read on. Trust not thou in their light. Go ahead. Neither respect their multitude. For one that is just is better than a thousand. So you may have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten children. But that one that is that you know is going to keep the commandments is better than the other nine. Understand that. Because the fear of the Lord is in them. And they're going to replenish and teach that to the next generation of children. Whatever. It, it, um, I'm going to get there later. I'm going to get there later. Read on. And better it is to die without children mm. than to have them that are ungodly. Damn. Drop the bomb on that one. It says better it is to die without children than to have them that are ungodly. Why would the Lord say that? Why? Why, why would the men of the Lord say that? Because when you have wicked children and they don't choose to repent, and keep God's commandments, they don't understand the value of God's commandments, what they're going to turn into is those monsters that we see on TV. They'll, those monsters are going to creep into your house and seduce your children to live by wickedness. Matter of fact, let's get that Proverbs. Proverbs uh, 12 and 26. Is that what I'm looking for? 12 and 26. It's, it's not a if, and, but, or maybe. It's not a, no, it's going to happen. And the scriptures tell you that. Go ahead. It's the book of Proverbs, chapter 12, verse 26. Go ahead. The righteousness, the, the, righteous. Me, the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. So, the right, God has his favorites. And that, you got to, a a righteous, the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. Read on. But the way of the wicked seduceth them. So, Wickedness is all around our righteous children. Wickedness is all around. And we're going to go into the various avenues that the wicked are trying to seduce your children. It's not, it didn't say they, the wicked may seduce them, might, possibly. It says the wicked seduceth. It says it's happening. And some of y'all don't realize or maybe don't care. That's how it seems. Some people just don't care. If your child is on, the, I got to just say, your child on the iPad 23 hours of the day, your child is being seduced. Their mind ain't working right. And then once they buck up against you, you're trying to figure out how do I reason with my child. Well, <laughs> you didn't keep the commandments. And let, matter of fact, let's get the commandment that is going to help you deal and nurture with the mind of your child. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. Go ahead. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Go ahead. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, mm -hmm. and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So, the scriptures teach us how to give instructional and exposure. I'm going to just put that into a catchphrase. Instructional exposure. You should be dealing with your children in every avenue that you have an opportunity. There are some children that go to public school and for eight hours of the day, they are around the wicked, being seduced with all, uh, all manner of evil from the world. The teacher could care less about their well-being and their home values. So, are you going to allow that to stand and take root in your child's mind? Or are you going to get active? 
And ironically, some people in the truth treat their local congregation classrooms the same way. The same way you drop off your child at school and don't care what they got going on, ain't never talked to the teacher, don't know what curriculum is being taught, you don't know where the your child stands until the report card come out, then you want to go to the parent-teacher meeting, have a fit, and then throw, cuss everybody out. Like, that matters. Because you're going to go right back to sleep and do nothing for the next nine weeks. But we do that in the truth, too where you don't know what's going on with your child. So what type of righteous conversation are you having? Or are you exposing yourself that you aren't having those type of conversations and you're only fostering an unprofitable child? You got to <laughs> we got to examine ourselves whether we and this goes to people who have children and people who don't have children and eventually want to have children. We got to really evaluate these things and start to think and set up a plan for God's heritage of future generations. Read that again. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. Go ahead. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. So what are we teaching diligently to our children? Get verse 1. Verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Go ahead. Which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Go ahead that ye might do them in the land where ye go to possess it. So what we are teaching to our children should always have the foundation of the Bible. It should be always rooted in our children learning God's laws, learning how to apply God's laws, learning the value of God's laws in application. I'll give you an example. You know, um, a lot of times we reward children give them stickers for various things and, and, and want to reward them, you know, maybe a sweet treat, whatever the case may be. It can get dangerous when you just reward them with open-ended statements. Oh, we're giving you this sticker because you're smart. For a child's mind, well, what does smart mean? What, what, what does it mean to be smart? I, I keep being told that I'm smart, but I don't know what smart means. I think I got the question right. I don't know how do you how can I tangibly see smart, but if we're using the Bible, hey, uh, little Adam, I saw how you corrected your brother in class today. That showed a lot of charity. Now that child has something to attach themselves. They they know the quality or attribute that they're living out. Right. Matter of fact, let's get that. Um, because that goes into this, condescending to men of lower state. Where is that? Romans? Romans. Romans. Condescending to men. Oh, here we go. Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Because all of these children have a place in the nation. And we have to, we, we have to groom them to serve their people. We have to groom them. That's the ultimate goal of the troubles of education to learn how to be a servant in this nation. Read on. Read that. Romans chapter 12 verse 6. Excuse me. Romans chapter 12 verse 16. Go ahead. Be of the same mind. The same mind. We as God's people, we as the Israelites have to have the same mind. We only get the same mind by God's laws, statutes, and commandments. And we learn and grow thereby. Read on. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Go ahead. Mind not high things. Go ahead. But condescend to men of low estate. Go ahead. But not wise. Be. In, be not wise in your own conceit. So, how does this convert the children? You always have to deal with children with ideas and concepts that are on their level. But how can you know what's on their level? If you're never really engaging them, you, n you never know uh, or never take any inventory of what your child is doing, what they're being exposed to, asking them questions about how does that affect them? How does it make them? You need to know these things so that you can redirect or add to. And we, we got to learn how to deal with that with grownups because you got some grown ass kids in this true too. 60, 70 year old men acting like 10 year old boys or thinking like that. That's crazy. 
but you still have to deal with them because, like has been said over the past few weeks, we have to administer the right medicine to our people. So in educating the young or the old, there are troubles that come along with it. Because <laughs> goodness gracious, huh? Some older men, they be, they be baffling me. I be troubled. I'm like, God, dog, I'm expecting you to teach me something, and you acting clueless. Just who raised, who raised you? Get your mind right. But, hey, you know, this is a hospital. We all need to be fixed, right? So dealing with the children, let's go back. Let's go back, and I want to get, let's get Isaiah 3. Uh, no, 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 no. Go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. That's where we'll go. Because how do we become unprofitable as the children of the Lord? All of us, whether it's uh, the young of the generation or the old or the elderly. We'll say the seasoned of our generation, right? <laughs> so let's get that. Deuteronomy 28 verse, let's start at verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. Uh -huh. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, mm -hmm. to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So Moses was the teacher of that day, right? He was commissioned by the Lord to go teach Israel these commandments and hold them to it evaluate them, judge them according to their actions, right? So Moses is telling the children of Israel, hey, your reward is that you'll be set on high above all nations. This is 100%. You ace in everything. If you listen and obey God with full intent, but if you want to be a derelict student, read verse 15. Verse 15. Mm -hmm. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, Go ahead. to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So now if you want to be that student in the back of the class, you want to be that student not paying attention. You don't want to obey. You, 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 you always bored with class, right? Falling asleep in class. Some people are bored in class, right? But when you're learning the instructions of the Lord for your good, you should always be paying attention because there's something to grow you. There's something to get, get, take you to your purpose, right? If you don't obey God, these great curses will come upon you. Let's deal with some that dealt with the children. I want verse 32. Then we're going to go in a different direction. Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Uh -huh. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. Go ahead. And there shall be no might in thine hand. So when we were taken into slavery, our parents had no military might, no uh, political might, and no financial might. Now, in these last days when we have the, the, the instruction of the Lord to guide us, shouldn't we be trying to strengthen our children to understand war, how to uh, establish and maintain government? Shouldn't we be teaching them how to uh, take money and use it as a defense with the wisdom of God? We're not in the same condition but somehow our minds are still gunked up in slave-like. So read that again. Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Given unto another people. Still to this day, we have to give over our children to other nations in, in various forms of fashion. Or so, Sometimes the nations take our children's attention with social media, with these tech, technology uh, avenues, they take our children's minds. But what are we going to do about it as God's people? Knowing that we see the wickedness of, of, of the world, what are we doing to preserve our children? Read on. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them 
all the day long. So that goes into us wondering where the children at, where they mind at, where they going. I don't know why I can't get over to them. The commandments say that we should be dealing with them anyway, watching for, watching over their soul. But somehow we still fall into to, to this position. So we as the, the guardians, those parents, we, we got to figure out and go to the scriptures to create that, to find that solution. Because it's already in place. Read on. And there shall be no might in thine hand. There shall be no might in our hand. So this is what I wrote. And I want you to get Isaiah 3 and 1. Lessons for development are all throughout the scriptures. But if we as parents and guardians are not applying the scriptures to learn a lesson for ourselves, we will lack the understanding to teach children. Experience is the greatest teacher. If you are always trying to avoid correction or you d rebel against correction, how are you going to teach anybody else? Matter of fact, you're going to have to learn. You, you're going to either have to accept that you're wrong when you try to avoid correction. You, when, you, when you're in that mindset, you got to eventually accept that you're wrong or you're going to you're going to go reprobate because you don't want to accept it. And eventually you will leave. But while you're here. These things got to be applied. You got to, as, as men, women, we got to go through certain things so that we understand that thought process that goes with overcoming, enduring, actually humbling our spirit to the laws of God. We got to know what that's like. Should I tell a story? I got, I got a story time. This is why your children, when they see me and I give them that look, Children be walking out of the room like, oh, I thought I was in trouble. No, I was checking to see if you was in trouble. Okay. A quick story time. Okay. There was a young man. I don't know whether it was in the spirit. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like Paul. <laughs> nah, that, that young man was me. So my granddaddy trying to teach me how to pray growing up. <laughs> if you know the story, you know the story. This is how dastardly children can be. But some some people... They, 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 they just make too much of their children, right? I don't, okay, because I know how dastardly I was. Granddaddy trying to teach me how to pray. And, you know, we doing it the Christian way, you know. So a couple nights passed, and my granddaddy said, why does it smell like piss in the room? <laughs> so meanwhile, this badass child, me, while... Granddaddy trying to teach me how to pray. I'm peeing on the floor. You can't put nothing past children, okay? I'll just put that out there. If you're making too much of your child, you see the evil they're doing, and yet you don't correct it. That's the, that's the point I want to make. That's why I don't put nothing past your child. My parents didn't put nothing past me. And as, as guardians to our children, they should always know that their people, their family, have expectations for them. And that's what we have to regain using the scriptures, those expectations. Now, meanwhile, I did get a whooping that night. I did get a whooping. That whooping, matter of fact, I tried to sing my way out of the whooping. I did. My dad, I, tr I tried. I tried. I thought it was going to work. What the hell is this? Yeah. Right, I tried to pray my way out. You know what I'm saying? We was in a Christian church. I tried to sing that hymn, you know. I know it was the blood that saved me. My dad was like, it ain't going to save you today. <laughs> All right, so let's get back into it. See, that's the power of a father being in the household, that hedge of protection. And sometimes that hedge come with thorns too. All right? <laughs> Where was that? Where were we at? Ah, Isaiah 3 and 1. So teaching your child from your experiences the good, the bad, the ugly, so that they can avoid those mistakes, all right? So um, go ahead, read Isaiah 3 and 1. It's the book of Isaiah, chapter 3 and verse 1. Go ahead. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, mm -hmm. the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. This is the point I want. Go ahead. The mighty man. And the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient. Go ahead. The captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counsel and the counselor, 
and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. So these are like prominent positions amongst our nation, prominent positions. But God said he's going to take away those men, those positions that acclaim, that prestige, that nobility. He was going to take that away. Why? Because we were in sin. You don't think that we could teach that to our children? We we always saying that our young men are Avengers. We always saying that they prophets, young prophets, this, that, and the third. But the lesson still remains if we're in the midst of sin, if we live by sin, God is going to take away those noble titles away from us. He's going to take away that prosperity from us. And now we see our communities looking a certain way based off us being in sin. Read on. And I will give children to be their princes. Go ahead. And babes shall rule over them. And that goes to show that now, without those men being in place, our nation is out of order. Our nation is out of order. We're going somewhere with this. Read on. Uh, uh, verse, what verse were we at? Verse 5. Go ahead. Read verse 5. Verse 5. And the people shall be oppressed. Every one by another. Go ahead. And every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Uh -huh. And the base against the honorable. So without us taking heed to God's commandments, our nation is out of order. The wisdom, we, we, we completely neglect the wisdom. We don't know what, nowadays it, it's so bad. Wisdom is right in front of a lot of our people, and they neglect it. They close their ears. They close their eyes. They shrug the shoulder, pull away the arm. They reject it. And guess what God is going to do? He's going to reject them and their generations. Jump down to verse 10. Verse 10. Say ye to the righteous Go ahead. that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. So if we teach our children righteous deeds and we, we see them uh, uh, rehearsing those righteous acts, it, everything is going to be well with them. And that's what we want to hear in, in at the end when we meet the, uh, Christ, when we meet the Most High and get that judgment. We want the Lord to say, well done. Right? Read on. Woe unto the wicked. Woe unto the wicked. Destruction unto the wicked. Read. It shall be ill with him. Go ahead. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. So the wicked, it's going to be ill. It's going to be ill, and that ill is going to be his reward. That's a lesson to teach the children. How does that apply to everyday life? Because when you're dealing with family and friends, sometimes it th and, and it's, it's a heavy thing, and I think a lot of us can attest to it. Sometimes the things that we hated about other people or those character traits, those, those flaws that others may have had in the world, we hated those things. I hated the way that he treated me. I hate the way that she dealt with me. But then we take on those same characteristics. Then we come into the truth, and then we treat God's hair. We, we repent. We say, I'm repenting, and you think that repentance is all by yourself, and then you begin to treat the people in the body the same way, with that same evil that when it was afflicted upon you, you didn't enjoy it. But we come into the body, and we do it that way, and then the children learn from it. We, we teaching children evil lessons. So we're going we to have to fix that. Uh, read verse 12. Verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Uh -huh. And women rule over them. And women rule over them. That goes even more so into out of order as a nation. Right? So we were talking about the young men earlier. Now we're getting into the young women. So there are always rewards and consequences written in the scriptures for whether we're young or old to learn by. These are, these are the troubles of education. Some of us are that hard-headed student. Some of us, we're going to have to fall, get that whooping, have to sit in the corner, go to the principal office, stay in detention for a whole week, get beat up, jumped in the hallway, <laughs> all kind of stuff. That has to be us. But then are you going to endure the troubles of education so that you can receive salvation in the last days. Is that That's what we got to make up our mind to do. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to, let's pull up. Oh, no, no, no. Keep reading. Keep reading. I'm sorry. 
O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. Go ahead. And destroy the way of thy path. And destroy the way of thy path. So children being our oppressors, women ruling over them, the nation being out of order, it's destroying the path of our people. Read on. The Lord stand up, up to plead and stand up to judge the people. So the Lord is going to judge his people. Read. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancient of his people. Go ahead. And the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your house. So that's another lesson right there. Your children get caught with things in their hand that don't belong to them. God is going to judge them. As a matter of fact, as parents, if you see your children stealing, taking things, you should be the first one to thrust them through. That's what the Bible says. That ju- the, the fear of the Lord is taught to children by them fearing their parents. I'm going to say that again. The fear of the Lord is taught to children first in the household when they learn to fear their parents. But if mama is coddling baby boy or baby girl and not tan, beaten on that side like they supposed to, daddy ain't in the seat of authority, he in the background and everything is okay. If, if, the, th- if the house is out of order, your children will never learn to fear the Lord. They will walk away from this truth. And then you're going to wonder why. You're going to wonder why. Now, keep reading. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? Go ahead. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. So this is a lesson for the daughters. Read on. And walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, Uh huh. walking and mincing as they go. And making a tinkling with their feet. So some of y'all ain't correcting y'all daughters. Some some of these daughters be haughty, all up in everybody's face, little boy's face, running around doing all kind of crazy stuff, and don't nobody say nothing. So this is a lesson that you can teach at home. Hey, baby girl, God got a judgment for you if you don't fix that thing, and this is what it looks like. Keep reading. Therefore. The Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of Go the ahead. daughters of Zion. Uh-huh. And the Lord will discover their secret parts. That got to be a lesson. That got to be a lesson. These little girls, teenagers, because some of our children don't fear judgment of the Lord. But if you got to walk around and you got to be, how do you used to pick at the girls back in the day? Fishy, fishy. Am, am I saying anything outside of the Bible? Nah. <laughs> he said Captain D's. Right? That's a judgment of the Lord for being haughty. Wanton eye. Stretch forth neck. Right? And we, oh, shoot. Jump down. Jump down to verse 24. We're going we're gonna to cut this short. Verse 24. Verse 24. Uh-huh. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Go ahead. And instead of a girdle, a rent. Uh-huh. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. Go ahead. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. Uh-huh. And burning instead of beauty. And burning instead of beauty. Right? So these are lessons that we should make sure. A re- I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my wife. I don't want that for my children. I don't want who wants that? So that should be a lesson. You see, if you see those traits coming out of your children, these, you, you better be teaching. You better make sure that these things are clear to your children because if they're not going to listen to you, if they're not going to listen to you when you're teaching them the word of God, you should already know that they're an unprofitable child, point blank, period. The scriptures will always define the good from the wicked. It will always do that. The scriptures are meant to try us and to humble us to see if we're going to keep the commandments or not. And that applies to children too, right? And some of these behaviors are learned. 
learned behaviors. So uh, I got to go there before we get into, uh, let's get Psalm 64. I got to go there. Some of these behaviors are learned. So some of you men are teaching your sons to be slothful, to lack care, to not uh, 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 have any concern to do any work, and you condone it. Some of you sisters are condoning your children to be haughty, to do whatever they want to do and have all kinds of liberties that uh, are worldly. Some of you households are allowing your children to do that and then play crazy when uh, uh, your children rebel against you personally. I don't know where this came from. I, I, I just, how much time are you spending with them? Well, when the last time y'all sat down and have a conversation? Well, you know, I've been working so much that your child is a part of your work. Your child was given to you as a heritage of the Lord for you to build them up for the Lord's use. But you're allowing someone else to raise your child. Shalom, Israel. This is Bishop Nathaniel. I want you to know that you can view all our Sabbath classes live on IUIC TV. That's right. I said on IUIC TV. Download the app today. Shalom. Israelite babies kids. We got a clip for that too. We got Israelite babies kids, right? <laughs> I like that sound bite, right? What I got you holding? Psalm 64. If you ain't watching your kids, you can best believe the enemy is. You can best believe it. They already got it calculated, and I'm going to show you that shortly. Go ahead. Psalm 64, and I want... Where it says, uh, diligent search. Yes, verse 6. Psalm chapter 64 and verse 6. Go ahead. They search out iniquities. So this is talking about the wicked, Esau, the so-called white man. They, and everybody who's in cahoots with them, they search out iniquities. Read. They accomplish a diligent search. Go ahead. Both the inward thought and every of every one of them. And the heart is deep. So, when the enemy is watching your children or already calculating what your children are going to do, understand they know the depth of evil that they're trying to persuade your children in. But they also know the height of greatness that we descend from. Get that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. So, when Esau does his search, that's why the Bible says they did a diligent search. They've already mapped out how much time mothers, uh, 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 black, Hispanic, Native American mothers spend with their children. They know how to calculate what kind of jobs are taken on the black woman and the Hispanic woman so that they aren't able to nurture their children. Yes, uh, four and five. They know. They've already searched these things out, so they know. That's why the homosexual community, LGBTQ, the alphabet gang, they can say, it's just a matter of time before we have your children. They done, they done did a song. They got a jingle. They were facetious in the song and jingle. And you know what? Some mothers and fathers just acted like that wasn't a plight coming from Satan himself. In this truth. Act like it was just shown to us for shits and giggles. Right? But they also, they know the height of our glory but they also know the depths of evil that they want us to fall into. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5. Go ahead. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments. Go ahead. Even as the Lord my God commanded me. Go ahead. That ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Go ahead. Keep therefore and do them. Keep therefore and do these commandments. Read. For this is your wisdom and your understanding. So they know. That by God's laws, we gain wisdom and understanding. And that wisdom and understanding exalts us above them. 
But they say, you know what? As long as they're in sin, we, as the enemy, can rule over them. Read on. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nation. Go ahead. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Go ahead. For what nation is there so great who have God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Go ahead. And what nation is there so great that have statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So the nations know that we are the children of God. They know that. But they know that they can't rule when we're in that wisdom and understanding. They know that. So that's a part of what we should be teaching our children. The wisdom and understanding that come from God's laws. That's why you have to talk with them, by the way, when they rise up, when they lay down, in the car, in the store, when you're going to school with them, just that all, every moment has to be spent making sure that our children understand their identity, their purpose. They're calling. Otherwise, Esau is going to give them a calling. Let's pull up some. Uh, I want to pull up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then cue up Bebe's kids. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because Esau already got your child mind and life mapped out. So let's look at it. Let's look at this. So if you're in the education field, you will recognize this. And even if you aren't in the education field, but you are homeschooling, you need to understand this because this is a part of what they teach your, the, uh, the teachers in many classrooms. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They say for any student to reach the height of their potential, th these things have to be in order. You can never reach the top until you have those things at the bottom to build upon. So the bottom uh, is physiological needs. So that child needs air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction. These are physiological needs that are necessary for children to reach their full potential, right? Matter of fact, let's get that chief things. This is why, as men, you'd be thinking we're talking about children, but the parents set up the household and the environment that that child receives those needs in. So let's get the chief things. Is that 21, 29, 29, 21? Let's get that. So Esau done searched out the Bible and know what our children need. And if we don't have them, then they know that they can put that wedge in there. You got it? Go ahead. Is the book of Sirach, chapter 29, verse 21. Go ahead. The chief thing. Put that thing back up there. Put it, put it back up there. Read it again. The chief thing for life is water uh -huh. and bread and clothing and in house to cover shame. So I'd be doggone if the white man ain't been studying our laws enough to know that this is the basic need. But, you know, there are women in this world who don't even give well, I'm, I'm talking about a specific case where the girl left her child for to celebrate her birthday. Then there's another case. It was on Facebook. I didn't uh, send y'all those links, but we're going to find them and we'll put them in the video, right? But the young lady actually suffocated her child because she had hatred towards the child's father. So that young lady took away a basic need from a baby, air. Pull up the clip of Bebe's kids. Pull, it, pull that clip up. Because sometimes we wonder why children are acting out, but there are certain needs that are not being met. And, and sometimes there are parents who want to cover those things up. But as a body, the scriptures say none of us should be lacking. But if you got so much pride on you to where you can't come to the body and be honest, then what, what, what are you doing here? You got to ask yourself that. Am I really here to be a part of the growth of a nation and, and to see God's laws actually live in us and through us? Or am I just here to be a leech, to be a cancer in the body? You got that clip of Bebe's kids? Let's get that. 
So everybody remember Bebe's kids. I was talking to uh, young prophet Jonah. He didn't know what that was because he a millennial. He was born just yesterday, right? Like Bebe's kids. You know what I'm talking about? Officer, I don't know what you're talking about. So let's let's play. This is the end of the movie. After Bebe's kids was at the uh, amusement park, tan up everything. Tan up everything, giving the dude a hard time. Now, you they're going to be shown as latchkey children. This is what latchkey children looks like. We were talking about that on the radio show earlier this week. Go ahead. Play that. Latch key. They got the key to the house because ain't nobody there. Mommy? Place look like move headquarters. Mommy? Mama? Are you home? Paul. Them children knew their mama wasn't there. But they were hoping she was. They, they, they were hoping mama is there. Because there's a certain level. We're going to get back to that. Well, keep playing. Keep playing. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dissect this thing. Go ahead. Please give the kids dinner. I'll be home soon, baby. <laughs> there comes <laughs> So, pause it right there, and we're going to go back. Ain't no food at the house. But you got three children that are coming home. They, they're not even going to see you at the house. But there's no physiological needs there waiting on them. Food. There's no food there. So now they got to wonder. And that's why they're hoping when mama come home, she might have something with her. Go back to the... uh. To the chart. I might not get through everything. I might not get through everything. Let's click over. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, physiological needs. That's basic, right? Above that goes into safety needs, personal security, employment, resources, health, property, right? And these are the types of things that can be taught. And as you see, um, some of these needs will, uh, can be focused as a child, but then you see certain ones that expand to adulthood. These are basic needs that you have in adulthood, right? A child is not going to provide themselves shelter uh, uh, at 10 years old. But as they get older, that's a basic need. That's why the Bible says it's a chief thing. So we got to teach our children how to acquire those things, how to take care of those things. Personal security, employment, create safety. Resources, health, and property going above to the next level, love and belonging. That's what those children, when they came in, mommy, where are you, mommy? They were looking for the love and belonging, companionship, where it says friendship, intimacy, family, sense of connection. And watch this. That love and belonging is what we should definitely be making sure of in this truth. Those, those bottom needs, that, we should definitely find that in, in the truth. There should be no one lacking physiological needs. There should be no one out on the street. There should be no one hungry. There should be no one who comes into the congregation and doesn't feel safe. There should be no one who comes into the congregation and doesn't feel like they're loved and like they belong here. That's why the first statement in repentance is welcome home. That That's statement right. alone gives a person a sense of love and belonging. But then, once you get all those basic needs at the bottom, guess what comes out of the individual? Self-esteem. You learn a sense of respect. Sense of self-esteem, you, you gain some type, you feel a, a level of status amongst your people. Once you take on an office and you see yourself putting in the work for your people, that's, a, that, that's something to be recognized for. Not for the eyes of men, but you're doing it because the commandments require it of us. Right. And it gives you a sense of strength. And guess what it also gives a sense of freedom, freedom from what the oppression that we've learned and had to endure here in America and all throughout the generations. But then the top level is what really takes the cake. It says self-actualization. You actually know what your purpose is. Your understanding is a part of building your calling in this truth. 
Self-actualization, a desire to become the most that one can be. A lot of our people come out of the world feeling like they're nobody. Their inner man has been destroyed through captivity. But through God's word, we're able to rebound and actually abound in the work of God. Matter of fact, let's get that. Let's get that. I'm, I said something. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Self-actualization. 1 Corinthians 15 is the last verse. It's the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Start verse at verse 57. 57. Verse 57. Go ahead. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. So God is giving us the victory. God is giving us the victory. How? Read. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through our faith in Jesus Christ and the keeping of the commandments, God is giving us victory. He's granting us salvation. And we're going to have the victory. If we apply God's commandments, we'll have the victory on this side and on the other one. Read on. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast unmovable and always abounding. You understand your purpose. You understand your calling and you're going to always abound in it because nothing can deter you from that. The word of God has already established it and you're walking it out because the Lord already gave you the victory. Finish that off. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. You are loved and you belong in this truth. You have safety and security. All your needs are going to be met. And the Lord has already promised you that victory. Now, go. I want you to look at Bloom's taxonomy. I want you to real quick. I might have to. Yeah, Bloom's taxonomy. I want, I'm going to do this one real quick. And then we're going to jump down to uh, where it has stages of psychosocial development. I'm going to try to run through these real quick. So, I want y'all to understand uh, this. This is how the mind takes in information. So, don't take it. Hey, we are not in this truth by coincidence. The way that our leadership has laid this thing out is all Bible-based. But, like I said earlier, the enemy has already searched the scriptures to know how we think. So, watch this. The bottom level says... Let me read that for me. Remember, retain and recall information. Go ahead. Reiterate, memorize, duplicate, repeat, identify. So imagine this being your walk in the truth. You, you, you couple, you know, months in, you get the precept or the welcome home kit. You begin to remember the things that are in the instructions to our righteousness, right? Then as you grow a little bit, you go to the next level. What is that? Understand. Go ahead. Grasp the meaning of something. Explain. Paraphrase. Report. Describe. Summarize. So we're putting this in terms of children, but I want everybody to really understand and grasp this concept. So we may recite the precepts. We may recall the precepts we, because we remember them. We rehearsed them so many times. But then over time, you begin to understand them. You can explain them. You can paraphrase them. You can report on them and describe their use. But then, as you grow, what should happen? Apply. Apply. So where, what class is this? Study, pray, and apply. What does it mean to apply? Read that. Use existing knowledge in new context. Uh-oh. So there are going to be new brothers and new sisters that come into the body that have demons and devils on them, and they're going to run into you. How are you going to deal with them? Now it's time to practice, calculate, implement the knowledge you already have to deal with them. That's why certain people are not allowed to counsel in the truth. There's a certain level of application that goes along with counseling. There's a certain level of application that's needed to build that experience to know how to deal with certain spirits in the body because there are certain operations and uses of the people that need to be uncovered and properly placed. Go to the next level because of application, well, remembering, understanding, that's low-level understanding. Application 
will it, it's kind of like that that uh, that plane that shows whether you're ready to go to the higher order of thinking or whether you're going to stay stuck on the bottom. Just re reiterating or repeating things that you've heard. You ain't really applied it, so you ain't going to get to the upper levels. That's why, that's why young men study the basics. After you study the basics and you apply the basics in your life, other things will be revealed to you in time because the application, the understanding of application, the scenarios and context of the application are going to offer you more wisdom. That's where the wisdom and understanding really starts to take root. Read on. Uh, analyze. Analyze. Explore relationships, causes, and connections. Go ahead. Compare. Contrast. Categorize. Mm -hmm. Organize. Distinguish. So when you begin to analyze things, this goes into where Sirach 11 and 7 says, uh, let's get that real quick. This is analysis in the Bible. Analysis in the Bible. Sirach chapter 11, verse 7. It's the book of Sirach chapter 11 and verse 7. Uh-huh. Blame not before thou hast examined the matter. Uh -huh. I mean, excuse me. Examine the truth. Go ahead. Understand first. And then rebuke. And then rebuke. Understand first. So get, get the report on things. Then, before you rebuke, you have to analyze the situation. So what? how is it that the white man can diligently search the scriptures and understand how to conquer us as God's people, but we as God's people won't go to the scriptures to solve everyday problems? The application is off. And then we look at the people who've been doing it like they don't know what they're talking about. You can't tell me how to raise my child. Well, I'm not trying to tell you how to raise your child. God is. And I'm just the messenger. Now, when you despise me, you ain't really despising what I think. I'm telling you what the Bible says. So you're really despising God. So joke's on you. I hate that it got to be that way, but sometimes you got to throw it back on. Joke's on you, really. It, it, you're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing your household. You're ultimately embarrassing God who gave you the acknowledging of the truth. Putting Christ to an open shame all over again. You don't even realize it. Right? Let's go back. Let's go back. So that's analysis. Being able to examine certain things. Be able to look at the, the various sides of the situation. Organize it. Make certain uh, 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 distinctions. Evaluate. 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 Make judgments based on sound analysis. Uh huh. Assess. Judge. What? Assess. Judge. So when judges and officers are put into congregations, these men should be able to go through all the scriptures, know the scriptures enough, have enough understanding and application to analyze and evaluate certain matters correctly. Then, because that's where you all, like I said, your judges, your officers, right? Your deacons should be capable of this. Definitely the bishop should be capable of this. But then let's go to the highest level of understanding. What is that? Defend. Create. Prioritize. No, go back. We, we had create to the highest oh, level. Cr create. Use existing information to make something new. See, this, this thing gives me chills every time I want to say it. So you mean to tell me our bishops, when they were in the one West schools, they had paid so much attention to the order and the structure, and they understood the value of those, that, those orders and structures that were taking place. They were able to go throughout the history and say, you know what? We weren't keeping the commandments like the scriptures say. Let's, we got to do what the Bible says and when we go and create Israel united in Christ. So we're going to use existing information so that we can invent the thing that is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. That thing is heavy. That's why they hate us so much, because they know that we're structured properly. And most importantly, we're structured by the word of God. Move me out the way real quick, just so I can see that last part. Use existing information to make something new. 
So anytime that we're, we have an idea, and this is for anybody in truth that may have a, a, a grand idea that they want to present, make sure that you've taken it through the gauntlet of the scriptures. Make sure that you've gotten counsel so that when things are being created, you've also t had people to analyze and evaluate and make sure that everything is being uh, uh, is in proper order to the application of God's laws. So don't get deflated if your idea don't, don't uh, take flight as soon as you bring it. Right. We've heard that before. Right. Now, jump over to Erickson's stage of psychosocial development. Like I said earlier, Esau got our lives mapped out. Matter of fact. Willie Lynch, let's get that first. I want to show that first. Dealing with the children. We about to wrap up. We almost done. Almost done. These last few things I want to show you all. Because the troubles of education, we're getting a, a diploma is good. It's a it's achievement. Getting a degree is an achievement. Don't don't I got one? Shoot, you know. However, in this walk, those things are very minute if we don't know how to direct that information to bettering our people. If we don't know how to use the information and our skills to better our people, then why did we invest so much time in it? Are we doing it to better our people or please the eyes, the hands, the ears of the white man? Ask yourself that. If you, That's why the stewardship program is so important because if you have a skill and you're not bringing it to the table to better your people, first off, you don't believe because you don't understand why the Lord brought you into the body with that talent. So if you're not going to give that over to your people, eventually you're going to die. You know how people take the recipes and stuff to the grave and stuff like that? Some people are going to take all their skills to the grave. So if that's the case, then you are that talent that get buried in the ground. Didn't even gain no, no other talents. Didn't Nothing got brought to the body to grow. You didn't bring anything out of yourself to grow the body. We all got to check our spirit and make sure that we're, we're presenting ourselves to the Lord to be used. All right. Willie Lynch. How we became unprofitable. Uh, I want the nigger marriage. Young, matter of fact, I'm proud of that young prophet. He called me, uh, was it this week or last week? And he was like, yeah, man, I'm reading Willie Lynch. I just wanted to go over it with you. Cool. <laughs> let's read, it's a quick read, so let's read through it. The Negro marriage unit. Mm -hmm. We breed two nigga males with two nigga females. Then we take the nigga males from them, keep them moving and working. So they've been doing that since slavery. Take the man away from the woman. We use him just to have sex and breed and have more sex and breed, but then we don't want him there to establish order. Read. Say the one nigga female bear a nigga female, and the other bears a nigga male. Both nigga females being without the influence of the nigga image. So without the influence of the male, the man, setting order, being that hedge. Read. Froze. With an independent psycho psychology, uh, psychology. Psychology. You know what's heavy? Willie Lynch, the white man, says, I want the black woman to be independent. And in the 299, 2000, the black woman got to say, I'm independent. No. You, I'm going to say it. You have a bear wench mentality. What the hell is this? I'm, I, I, I ain't even want to spell it. All right? But that independent psychology is, is meat for the white man's use, not God. Go ahead. Froze with an independent psychology. Uh-huh. Will raise their offspring into reverse position. So they will raise their offspring, their children, in reverse positions or reverse roles. Read on. The one with the female offspring will teach her to be like herself. Will teach her to be like herself. Go ahead. Independent 
and negotiable. Hold on. So if they remove the nigga male from the household, who's she negotiating with? She negotiating with the white man. Read. We negotiate we with her. We negotiate with her. Go ahead. Through her, through her, by her, and negotiate at her will. At her will to do what I tell her to do as the white man. Read. The one with the nigga male offspring. She being frozen with a subconscious fear for his life uh -huh. will raise him to be mentally dependent and weak. Will raise that young boy to be mentally dependent on her and weak. Because even in this truth, you got some mama's boys. Mentally dependent on the mama and weak. And the mama's going to make him meat for the white man's use. Go ahead. But physically strong. But he's going to be stronger than an ox. Read. In other words, body over mind. And that's how they created us into being a slave. They took our body, or they took away our mind to be in accordance with God's laws, but they kept our body to make good economics. Let's get the next part. Because the prized possession is always the male. Understand that. Go ahead. By the time a nigga boy reaches the age of 16. Go ahead. He is soundly broken. He is in. what? He is soundly broken in. Go ahead. And ready for life sound and efficient work and the reproduction of a unit of good labor force. Of a good labor. So ready for life's sound and efficient work as a good labor force. And they say that they know that they can create that by the time a child, a nigger male, is 16. Mind you, the white man got us mapped out from birth to death. Let's get Erickson's stage of psychosocial development. Why did he say 16? What's going on? What's going on in, in these age ranges? What's going on? So let's look at this. He searches out. He does a diligent search. So mind you, now, during the time of 1300s, 1400s, you know, Esau always was sticking close to try to find out information about our people. Okay? We had a video dealing with um, how the white man regarded our women's breast milk. They called it liquid gold. They, their children were dying off at an alarming rate from malaria. But... They said, well, if we use the Negro uh, woman's milk, we can allow our children to be preserved. But guess what they gave uh, the, the Negro children? They gave them dried, unhealthy cow's milk and mixed it with dirty water. What do we call that nowadays? We call that formula. And some black women would prefer to give their children synthetic nutrients rather than breastfeeding their children properly over those over those ages that, that is necessary to develop proper brain function so if the white man is that deep with his understanding and he can map out our existence we need to understand how valuable we are to god and and understand how valuable god made us from the beginning that's right so let's we're going to read through it quickly. Infant to 18 months. What is learned? What is the crisis and task that is learned? What does it say? Trust versus mistrust. And as you overcome that, what is developed in the child? Hope. Oh, man. So hope is established in a child between infancy and 18 months. Where do they get that from? The hope because they're building connections with their parents. Read the next one. 18 months to three years. Go ahead. Autonomy versus shame, doubt. Autonomy, being able to, to show themselves worthy, right? That autonomy, being a, uh, um, self, basically like self-purpose, right? What virtue is developed at that age if they are instructed correctly? Will. They have a will. They build that will to do what is already established amongst the greatness of their people. They see the greatness in their people or acknowledge their mother for who she is. They acknowledge the father for who he is, and I build that will based on the instruction they give me. Read. Uh, go to the next one. Three to five years. Go ahead. Initiative 
versus guilt. Initiative versus guilt. That that get up and go spirit versus guilt. Why? What's the virtue develop? Purpose. Purpose. So at that age, now you start to give children various little tasks. All right, we're going to create a list. You're going to brush your teeth. You're going to wipe down the sink. Because now they're developing purpose. They're starting to understand how they function within the family. Now they're building that belonging. Read the next one. Five to 13 years. Uh Uh-huh. Industry versus inferiority. What virtue is developed? Competency. Competency. This is the age range where the white man really starts tapping. Between 3 and 13 years old, they really start tapping into our children because they want to understand their purpose, and then they want to see how competent they are. That's why with uh, Jawanza Kunjufu, with the book Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys, at that 9-year-old age range, when they're 8 and in the 3rd grade, they're scoring at alarming rates. They're in the top. Not, uh, the 95th percentile, top of the class, genius. But then they go to fourth grade and they go into that slump because what are they doing? They're trying to tap into their purpose and derail them from it. They're trying to put that inferior uh, core, uh, inferiority complex into them to destroy their competency. Why? Because the next level shows something. This is where we start to lose a lot of children in the truth. We start to lose those teenagers. Read that. 13 to 21 years. Identity versus confusion. Identity versus confusion. Find a definition for fidelity. I want to bring something out on that. Go ahead. Identity versus confusion. So we've been teaching identity from from the time that children are born, teaching them they're an Israelite. They've been able to recall the books of the Bible. They're able to understand. But now this is when they start to take on the roles and the actions that define their identity. And if those things that they've learned or witnessed have been taught at home do not align with the purpose that's given to them from the Bible, this is why we see children leave the truth. Because what they should be doing, according to the Bible, is not what they're learning at home. Some things are unstable. And we got to fix that. Because it deals with fidelity. Get fidelity. Definition for fidelity. Because we know about infidelity when people are cheating. or That's what we always call it, infidelity. Right? But read what the definition of fidelity means. Fidelity. Faithfulness to a person. To a person. Cause uh-huh. or belief. Go ahead. Demonstrate it by continuing loyalty and support. Oh, wow. So this goes back to the love and belonging. The love and belonging. If your home environment is not congruent with what your belief is, I don't know where I fit in, so I'm going to run away. Identity versus confusion. So a lot of children are running away from the truth because what's going on at home and what's being taught at the school are two totally different things. So who's responsible for that? The Lord knows. And if you examine it yourself, you know too. Go back. Nah, go back to the chart. We're going to finish it off right here. Then I want 2 Maccabees 7. First Maccabee or second Maccabee seven. So identity versus confusion. Fidelity also goes into that nation building mindset. Your faithfulness to your people. Revert. Oh, I said verse twenty one verse uh, through thirty nine. Twenty one to thirty nine years. Uh huh. Intimacy versus isolation. So once you understand your identity, your your purpose within your people, at twenty one years old, at twenty years old, what what? It says intimacy versus isolation. The virtue developed is love. Why? What, where do we find this in the Bible? Because at 20 years old, you are of maritable age. Wow. You're at maritable age. So you learn to love and build your nation from that. Read the next one, 40 to 65. 40 to 65 years. Uh-huh. Generativity. Versus stagnation. Go ahead. And then virtue develop. Care. So at these age range, 
you you're productive you're showing that productivity you're building those virtues within people under you you have your family you're building your family at, at these ages right building them up making sure that they're pro uh, and producing properly because the virtue developed during this age is you learn how to care for other people you you're really understanding what care is in these ages. You're developing a family. You're building with other families. You're building community. You're seeing your purpose really unfold outside of yourself. Read the last one. 65 and older. So this is when we're preparing to die. How, do, how does Esau know all this? Right? Read, read the, uh, the, the psychosocial crisis and task. Integrity versus despair. Integrity versus despair. And what's the virtue developed? Wisdom. Wisdom. So at this age, you should be the elder in your community, teaching the wisdom to those who are behind you, making sure that you are that counselor to build their productivity, to make sure that they understand and they are competent of what their purpose is amongst the nation. How does he know all this? Let's get second Maccabees. And this is where we're going to close off because we always uh, recognize what the sister said uh, or the sister uh, 2 Maccabees 7, right? Dealing with in verse 27. This is the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 7, verse 27. Go ahead. But she bowing herself toward him, laughing the cruel tyrant to scorn. Go ahead. Spake in her country language on this manner. So this is the sister who has seven sons, and she had to watch all of them die. Because a cruel tyrant was trying to make our people, the nation of Israel, eat swine to their liking. Serve me, said this cruel tyrant. Serve me. Don't serve your God. Join with me and I'll, I'll give you all the riches that you want. I'll, make, I'll sit you beside me. I'll, I'll give you a noble name in my kingdom. But this woman said, no, nah, it ain't going down like that with my household. Read. Oh, my son, have pity upon me. So she told her son as he was getting prepared to die. That's what our leadership is talking about. Preparing the men and women. Don't fool yourself. You're going to get killed too. When it all boils down, those that are faithful will have the honor of being killed for this gospel. And that's how we got to look at it. It's an honor. So if the man going to die honorably, the woman should be looking to die honorably. What are we teaching our children? What are we teaching our children? Peter told his wife, remember the Lord. This is what we've been waiting on. Remember the Lord at this time. Read on. Oh, my son, have pity upon me that bear thee nine months in my womb. So you was in my womb nine months. Let, let's go down memory lane real quick. You was in my womb for nine months. Read. And gave thee suck three years. Uh oh, she didn't give him Similac for three years. Gave thee suck three years. Damn. Cut. Right? Gave thee suck for three years. Read. And nourished thee and brought thee up unto this age. So, whatever age these young men were, the mother said, I brought you up to this age and I was preparing you for this moment. The foundation of the curriculum was God's laws. And guess what? We knew this was going to happen. The prophecies told us this. We understood what we were up against. We knew that this day was coming, but it just, happened, it just so happens to be today that we got to show ourselves sealed unto the Lord. Read. And endured the troubles of education. So the troubles of education ain't necessarily to get a diploma or degree. Those things are good. Don't get me wrong. Those things show the achievement of our children and their growth in concepts and understanding. But in this truth, we got to build up our children to really understand the, the real test of being sealed for this gospel. And guess what? We don't know who the father is, right, of these, these seven boys. But was there a male influence that guided them in their decision making? Let's go back one chapter. Uh... Uh, chapter 6, verse 18. So there was always a figure set in place to guide the minds of the people. So this was that 
elder, like we just saw in, 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 the, uh, in the chart, the wisdom came through the actions. Read that, 6 verse 18. Second Maccabees chapter 6 verse 18. Go ahead. Eleazar, one of the principal scribes, an aged man. An aged man. He was old. Read. And of a well-favored countenance was constrained to open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh. Go ahead. But he, choosing rather to die gloriously than to live stained with such an abomination, spit it forth and came of his own accord to the torment. So that was the example that was seen by those young men. That was the wisdom that they were able to see from those of their nation. They said, I love my nation. I belong here. And if you know what, if old man Eleazar is going to die for the covenant of the Lord, shoot, we all got to die for the covenant of the Lord. When we look at the Maccabean brothers, they looked at one another and said, we are going to die. Who did they look to for the wisdom? Their father. So guess what? Family is necessary in this truth. Family is much so necessary, and there are going to be troubles of education that come with that. But the education is not to receive the achievement or a plaque or a, 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 a certificate by man. It's for the most high to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, to show ourselves approved in these last days. So we're going to end it with this, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. So this is another study, pray, and apply class. So all these things are, are going to always come full circle for our nation. We are children. We have children. We have a nation that needs to be built up. We're, hey, we still uh, 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 sucking from the breast of these scriptures day by day that we may grow by them. But we got to have our minds set and really understand the fullness of of the mission and the calling that we've been called into. Go ahead and read that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Go ahead. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Go ahead. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Those are the troubles of education. When we study things in the scriptures, we're going to be tried by them. We may fail, but we get back up. We understand repentance. We keep thriving. We may get hit upside the head. We might have to sit in the corner. Might have to be put on timeout. Can't go to recess, right? Can't buy a cookie at lunch. <laughs> All, right. All these things happen to us and will happen to you if you have faith. You, if you have faith in this truth, the Bible says prepare your soul for temptation. Read on. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So we read with intention. We read with the intent to obey. When we make a mistake, we know that there's promises that we can get back up and still obtain salvation. So with that, that'll be the end of tonight's class. I pray that you, you all were edified. I pray that this builds up the households that are already established with children, already established in self-examination, and those households that are without children and preparing for children. Mm -hmm. I pray that this all right, so family, I enjoyed tonight with you all. Uh, pray that y'all will edify. Most high in Christ bless you. And we out. Shalom. What is the nation? Nation is men leading by example. Nation is family. Nation.